Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Rob Austin Goodall. Um, I'm going to be moderating this the webinar, Engineering the Supply Chain, and uh, it's 12.30, so we're down to start. Um, first, some housekeeping. Um, please feel free to ask questions um, throughout the webinar. Uh, if you've got a technical question as well if you can't hear or, or you're having struggle receiving please do that in the chat box uh, again for those who haven't accessed the chat box if you look at the right hand side of your screen you'll see a black tab with a white arrow on it if you click on that you'll have a list then uh, which will which will include uh, a section called attendee chat if you click on that to la uh, launch a window uh, and if it's minimized click on the plus icon in the top right hand corner of that box and that will open it up and please type in there. Firstly, thank you very much for those who already have submitted uh, uh, some chats and some questions. I know Harvey's been busy answering some of those. Uh, so if you have, have any questions, whether it be regarding the webinar or technical issue, please enter them in the chat. Today, um, the webinar was presented by uh, Harvey Leach and Paul Kelly. Uh, as you can see, uh, they're very friendly faces that, that are uh, on the screen now. Um, I say myself, Rob Austin Goodall. And uh, as we want to get this up and running as quick as possible, I will hand over to Harvey. Great. Thanks, Rob. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see me. I was too busy in interacting with people in the chat box to notice that uh, Robert was just about to start. So uh, I'm hoping I got the microphone switched on OK. Um, so yeah, pleasure to be here. And just to give you a brief overview of my background, actually my interest in Mini is because uh, that's where I ended up my career with uh, BMW Group after just over 25 years in what was variously British Leyland and Rover and BMW. Uh, I started off in research and product development, later moved into production control and strategy roles before leaving the Mini plant in 2004. And since then, I've been a consultant and trainer trying to use the breadth of experience that I got over that time in sort of product development and manufacturing environments, really helping companies focus on using better process to help multidisciplinary teams work together more effectively. Uh, and it's my pleasure on today's webinar to be working with my colleague and friend, Paul Kelly, from whom I've learned even more about supply chain over the last few years since we started working together. Brilliant, thank you, Harvey. Yeah. Um, my background is a combination of product and systems development, primarily work in the world of IT, and then, uh, as Harvey indicated more recently, in, in supply chain management. Uh, most of that experience has been in the telecommunications and technology sectors. Uh, I guess as a quick reflection before we start, my, my experience of working in global supply chains, including especially in after-sales service supply chains, is that there's a common theme that runs through the topics that we'll cover today and the work I do with organisations as well to help improve their supply chains. And that is, I guess, at a simple level, the need for collaboration and engagement between the world of product design and the world of supply chain management. And it's in these areas that I'm, I guess, get the most interest these days. That's where I get my, I guess, buzz around uh, uh, how to help organizations improve uh, and to help get their operating models fit for purpose to meet challenges that we all face in today's complex world and environment. So without further ado, let's go on to our agenda for today. Um, once we've completed the introduction to today's themes, what we're going to do is just share just a little bit of context which we think is relevant to the worlds of both product design and to supply chain. And then we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the changing nature of, of customer demand, because absolutely that's really key in driving what we do and why we do it. And then we're going to explore some areas where we feel product design and designers can help with these challenges. And then finally, we'll close up with some further information. We're aiming to get time for some Q&A, uh, uh, especially if we don't get time to answer those as we go through um, as we go. So, Agenda, let's start with completing the introduction to the topic for today. Okay, thanks, Paul. So, to introduce that today, we're really looking at this intersection of the two areas Paul, met, Paul and I mentioned. Um, 
I guess most of the engineers who are in product development in the room will be familiar with some version of a, a product lifecycle diagram. This one shows a sort of linear progression of a product lifecycle. And a lot of you will be working, I guess, in the in the new product introduction area, which sort of ends or potentially ends at or around production launch. But in my experience, fewer engineers working in this arena are really familiar with the challenges around manufacturing and supply chain. So this other set of processes that, that interacts and how the decisions that are made during product development actually impact on the way supply chain operates. Paul. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about what we mean by supply chain. So there are so many definitions and terminology out there so we provided here just a very high level view which summarizes the main both management and logistic activities that make up an end-to-end -end supply chain. Obviously, depending on the industry and the markets, these activities are carried out in different ways uh, and often with different levels of importance. But where it always starts with is with planning. So at its simplest level, this is all about uh, those activities uh, involved with balancing supply with demand. And, and as a result of that, ending up with a, uh, a, a course of action, a plan. Uh, this activity can happen both at a strategic level uh, with a long-term horizon or at an operational or tactical level, which in the most dynamic of supply chains it can be real time. It can be a minute by minute uh, activity. Sourcing covers all the activities associated with the purchase of materials, components, sub-assemblies, and the management of all the inbound logistics. Again, there's both a strategic and operational dimension to these activities. Production, I guess we understand, is the basic uh, uh, activities involved with manufacturing and assembly and products. And then we like to talk about delivery. <clears throat> so this is covering all the outbound activities associated with getting the product to its end customer or user. Often we'll refer to it as forward logistics. And this can involve very, very simple distribution of a finished product to its destination, or it may involve multiple forward logistic operations to support complex distribution channels involving distributors, wholesalers, intermediaries, re retailers, often using multiple channels. So it could include store or home delivery, for example. Often forgotten is the equivalent reverse flow. Reverse logistics or returns management is the inevitable result of a forward logistics process. Sometimes products come back, especially in the retail and today's omnichannel world. So sometimes I call this the home for the unwanted. After sales service can cover a myriad of product and customer support activities, monitoring product performance, maintenance and repair, as well as the management of spare parts. And finally, we get onto end of life activity. In supply chain terms, this covers all those logistics and the commercial activities involved in recovering reusing and recycling of products or product components and materials. Both after sales, service and end of life are becoming increasingly important, complex and costly as new services are being developed. Businesses servitize their business models, return volumes increase, or in some cases just due to the increasing interest that we have as a society uh, in and also the regulations associated with that around sustainability and the circular economy. The topic we're considering today is really about all the decisions made during the concept and design stages that then impact on the supply chain, how it operates, and in turn, how that impacts the performance of the organization. Let's talk a little bit more now about the context and the environment we're all working in, and as designers, as manufacturers, and those with responsibility for supply chain management. So I'm hoping now you can all see a slide that has those words that some of you may, may be familiar with, um, that acronym VUCA. So we are now all living in a VUCA world. For those of you who haven't heard the term before, it was originated in the 1990s in the US Army to describe the new reality of waging war, warfare in places like Afghanistan. As you can see, it stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it has become our new known. But what does this look like and how does it impact the role of designers? Let's start with the massive demographic changes that the world is undergoing. 
whether it's population growth, an aging population, millennials making up the majority of the workforce, or our obesity crisis. Those uh, we are designing for are changing. Just think about the design of an aircraft seat, both in terms of its size and its shape, as well as the expectations around the integration of technology. None of us can live without our seat in-seat charging uh, facilities these days. Linked to this are the economic changes we are experiencing. The rise of China and India, both as consumers and producers. The impact of globalization impacts where the products you design will be produced and in which markets they will be sold. Designing a hat for the Chinese market is very different for the US from the US or the EU. All you need to do is just ask Nike about their launch of a green hat in China. If you don't know this story, then just Google the meaning of green hat in Chinese culture. Sustainability is also a really pressing issue. I heard an estimate the other day that highlighted that in really simple terms, it, we would need two planets to sustain the same level of consumption as today by the year 2030. Again, in the same time horizon, if we don't take any action, then it's predicted that by weight, there will be more plastic in the sea than there will be fish. I guess one example of our VUCA world is to reflect how many of us were thinking about plastic usage in terms of product design and packaging, even just two years ago. I know I wasn't. And the least said about our political VUCA, the better. But it is clear that with increased trade wars and Brexit, once again, the products we design and manufacture are not going to be totally immune from these impacts. I guess finally, the reflection here is not only these radical changes that are part of our challenging context, but also the speed at which they are happening. So just remember, in 2006, the iPhone, the iPad, Uber, Airbnb didn't even exist. Uh, and this is a fact that's well known. I guess it took 75 years for the telephone to reach 100 million customers. The internet took seven years, but Instagram took only two years to achieve the same reach. And I'm told, but I'm no expert, Pokemon Go took only one month. Even as late as 2012, Nokia was the number one mobile phone manufacturer and nobody had even heard of Huawei. And I guess that leads me on to that last factor, technology. Whether it's omnichannel, servitization, or digitization, there are some real significant changes that are both creating new types of products to be designed, think about electric cars, or changing the way they are being produced, think about robotics, or enabling different ways for us as designers to design products. So think about the collaborative tools or digital prototypes that are now available. Of course, it hasn't always been this way. 400 years ago, life was an awful lot simpler. I mean, pretty much nobody had anything in terms of products or technology, and the pace of change was pretty slow. Only the rich could afford stuff to have more than basic things made, and pretty much everything was handmade by craftsmen at the same price. And, you know, to me, this diagram from Boston Consulting Group pretty much summarizes the evolution of manufacturing over the time since then. You know, we came to the first revolution, which, of course, now people started calling it Industry 4. They are now calling Industry 1, Industry 1.0, changed all that. You know, we had water and steam power enable machines and factories to be built, products made in great volume. But it was really only into the 20th century uh, that the use of electricity and the work of pioneers like Henry Ford brought prices down as they produced well-designed products in high volume. So that was mass production, or what people refer to now as Industry 2.0. And, and as Simon and I were chatting in the chat box earlier, you know, this is where we got Henry Ford with his, his one standard Model T, everyone the same, every colour as long as it's black. But people didn't actually mind about that too much, because for most of them, it was the first time any products like this were in their price band anyway, and they were just delighted to have something. I don't think that feeling lasted very long. People started looking, well, everybody's got a car the same or whatever it is the same. And I want mine a bit different from my neighbours, as long as it doesn't cost too much more. So what that drove was then manufacturers were, were trying to make increasing variety in their products, but often at the cost of holding an awful lot of inventory of all the different components that led them to, to satisfy this emerging uncertainty in demand and their loss of competitiveness because their products didn't differentiate. Now that built over the, over the 20th century and the challenge towards the end of the century and the early parts of the 21st 
were really around how to satisfy this growing demand for individuality and customization. And according to the term mass customization, now industry 3.0, as those benefits of mass production were progressively eroded, and yet customers were expecting they'd get that variety, uh, they'd get that individualization, but they'd still get it in the same time scale and at the same price as they'd been paying for their previous products. And this sort of challenge drove an awful lot of Western companies to learn from the experience of the Japanese, particularly in the automotive and electronics industries, who through necessity post World War II had much earlier on developed ways to deal with some of these challenges more effectively. You know, and, and recent years have kind of seen that uh, pace of change, that trend accelerate and the level of variety and individualization has got greater and greater as newer technologies have come on board. You know, some of the things Paul talked about a minute or two ago about extending beyond the physical product around services, around ancillaries, around software, um, leading to what we now refer to as Industry 4.0. So here we see the different elements commonly included within that concept of Industry 4.0. However, critical here is not only to think about the separate technologies, but also how they work together to radically change the design options and potential service offerings. So for example, autonomous robots, along with additive manufacturing, will radically change the factory infrastructure, its tools and its fixtures. So considering design for manufacturing assembly means considering a very different production environment with different constraints, but of course, no doubt many new opportunities. The combination of the Internet of Things and big data analytics has opened up a whole new opportunity for preventative maintenance regimes and has led to the whole concept of servitized business models that we mentioned earlier. So from power by the hour to pay per use printing. So for example here you could take a look at a German company called Schnippering. They're a global printing machine manufacturer and, and, and that and so it's great to have a just quick look at their website and see the generation of products and services that they've developed over the years. And then, of course, there's the automotive industry, moving from selling cars to the concept of selling mobility. Augmented reality and simulation has brought us digital twins that both revolutionize the prototype process as well as in-life support and monitoring. There are going to be increasingly many more opportunities to think about, both in the, in the way that we design, and in the products that we are going to design. So having heard some of our views on the wider environmental challenges faced, we would like you to start thinking about this question. So thinking about the VUCA world and Industry 4.0, specifically its impacts on products you design, what are your top three challenges? So if you could help to provide some of your thoughts and questions around that on the chat box platform, that would be a great and, and, and that input would be really, really useful to both us and to the team at IMECI to help keep developing content that is relevant and useful to us all. So I'll just pause for a second to, uh, to let you to think about that, that, that question uh, before we move on to the next part of the agenda. So what are those top three challenges? So now what I'd like to do is just move on to discussing some more specific issues we're all facing particularly related to that changing nature of demand. So from a customer demand perspective, we see two really big drivers impacting the supply chain we talked about earlier. Firstly, there are a greater number of expectations for individual or bespoke solutions. That's challenge number one. Allied to that is the expectation for ever decreasing lead times. Customers want the product now. So that is challenge number two. In highlighting these challenges, there's an underlying tension with the supply chain. Both could be achieved to some degree by increasing the amount of inventory that is held in the supply chain, but therein lies the challenge. More inventory means more cost and more risk of obsolescence. In that VUCA world we refer to, that risk is even higher. So we talk about these increasing customer expectations as the complexity challenge, and the lead time challenge. Both of these are conspiring to put pressure on the supply chain. So let's talk about these challenges a little bit more. 
Okay, so now we come back to my, my mini challenge. And I just want to use the evolution of the, the new mini, you know, forgetting the original uh, going back to the 1950s and 60s, but the new generation. Um, and just see how that trend for variety and individualization has been affecting companies by using this familiar example. Of course, by the time the first Mini came along, we were already an awful long way from Henry Ford's one model in any color you like, as long as it's black. And yet, despite that, the first of the new Minis was only initially offered only in one body style. In our case, so maybe it was one and a half for the, uh, the detail as amongst you, because the Cooper S had a different bonnet with a hole in it. Um, and it was only later in its life it became two with the introduction of the convertible. And of course, each of those was available with a whole load of options. Uh, but it was still a relatively small number. By the time we came to the second generation, seven years later, that number of different basic body styles grew to eight with more and more options. And by the time the current generation came along, um, we'd got a whole range of mini products out of it. Uh, we, we'd, we were starting to build uh, BMW badge products on the same platform using the same components. Um, and my colleagues at BMW tell me through the lifetime of this vehicle overall, there'll be over 20 different ve different vehicles built using that same basic set of bits. And with that increasing range of options, those supply chain challenges Paul alluded to um, actually become greater and greater. So let's come back to the question that we asked right at the beginning of the webinar while we were waiting for us to start. Uh, and let's take my typical mini clubman. These are just a few examples of the range of different possibilities you can have. So overall, 10 different possible engines, 123 different options, eight specific country requirements to consider, uh, seven packages of options you can specify, 12 different basic body colors, and then you can have a black roof or a white roof or a silver roof, 11 different types of upholstery you can fit in the car so my question was really and and i know simon had and we started this debate about what constitutes a standard part um but by a standard part i mean one of those things that is in the options catalog it's a part bmw have designed and intend to make available it's not a part that's been made specifically for one individual because that takes us into another arena altogether so with those combinations of, of designed, originally designed parts, how many different mini clubmans do you think could be made without there being two the same? Just pop your answers in the chat box for a minute. I'll give you about 20 seconds to, to put your answer. And let's just see. I did, when I run this on the uh, design for manufacture course, we sort of usually get into a bit of a competition and a challenge. So please start typing your guesses in. I haven't seen any yet. Nobody gonna guess. And don't be afraid of getting it wrong. Just just stick a number in and let's let's just see. It's a bit like an option. Wow, somebody's been really precise. Murat, have you seen this before? Ten million? Oh, a hundred jacks going. So we've got a range of answers, twenty thousand. Um nine million goes Daniel. It's going up. Sixty thousand, nine million from Paul, seven hundred and fifty. Nobody's anywhere close yet, by the way. Yeah, you can't just multiply those numbers together, by the way. If you take all of the possible combinations, guys, um, maths will certainly help Murat, but it doesn't quite get us there. The real, the actual answer is if you take all the factory available options in the combinations you could conceivably order them, you get over a billion possible cars you could make. Um, and that is a huge number. And you could think we couldn't possibly just make one of those just in case somebody comes along and orders one. We've got to find a way of you know, 10 times 10, 10 times 10 to the power of seven. That's probably about right, isn't it? Um, anyway, it's a huge challenge in terms of, of meeting customer demand. So let's just think about how that works out from a supply point of view. We've talked about the variety challenge. We now come to thinking about the lead time challenge. because. If we were in a world where 
the time from when the customer placed his order to the time when they expected to get delivered the product, if that time was longer than the time that it took us to do a design, it took us to source all the parts, it took us to put them all together and get the product out to where the customer wanted to pick it up. If our customer expected time was longer than all of those times put together, we wouldn't have a problem because everybody in the process is dealing with certainty. Everything can be done within the lead time. Managing the supply chain gets really simple. However, that's rarely the case in, in most industries. You know, most of the time, customers may expect to get stuff an awful lot quicker than the added up lead time for designing, sourcing, making, delivering. So that, what that means, depending on how big that mismatch is, you know, whether that place or the line falls in the design stage, the source stage, the manufacture stage or the delivery stage, somebody somewhere is going to have to make decisions about what to design, what to buy, what to make before we know what the customer is going to order. Of course, if we get that wrong, the, the consequences could be we design the wrong product or we've got too many of the wrong parts and not enough of the parts we need. We might end up with, you know, high levels of inventory just in case. So we've got this cost and obsolescence risk Paul talked about earlier. And the more and more variants we add on, you know, with that over a billion possible variants, how do we do that? You know, how do we meet that challenge? Because you couldn't possibly have a warehouse full of all of the possibility just in case the customer ordered them. We need some better thinking and science and product design, which we'll come back to in a little while. But, you know, because the one answer that's certainly never true is you can't make that lead time shorter. The activities that need to be done just can almost never be compressed to meet that expected lead time. So there's another idea to introduce you to, which is what if by thinking more carefully, considering all the possibilities and the things customers might order much earlier than product development process, we could take some of the decisions that need to be made about what to design or to buy or to make outside of that order to delivery cycle, what we might be called externalizing the product. And actually then allowing us to really just focus on those really customer specific requirements and managing them within the lead time, which might even include, if you can see that little dark green box sitting over the deliver, putting some of the customer options in during the delivery process. Um, to demonstrate what I mean by externalizing, let's think about a Formula One pit stop. Um, and if you go on YouTube, you can see some videos of when actually they didn't start thinking about what to do until the car arrived in the pit. But what would it be like if all of the activity you needed had to happen when the car arrived in the pit lane? These days, it's nothing like that. You know, we're into sort of one and a half second pit stop times. But how, that only happens because of some really clever planning and thinking and not an insignificant amount of product design to enable those really fast times to be achieved. And that's a really good example of what you might think of as the Formula One supply chain and its product design environment working in harmony. So how do we make that sort of design, that sort of idea rather, that sort of approach to design a reality for the sort of products we're all working with in our normal production and consumer world? Yeah. So how can product design really help that is our pivotal question. You know, how can good an approach to product design help reduce order lead times and reduce complexity within the supply chain? And there's a whole host of areas we could consider. Um, and, and we go into some of these more on some of the longer public courses. But for, the, for today's webinar, we're going to pick three that illustrate the variety of approaches and ideas we need to be thinking about. The first one is how do we design for that late configuration, that externalization process that I talked about a minute ago? Uh, perhaps how do we use standard components? And just to be confusing, Paul's going to talk about standard components in the sense of ones we can actually buy off the shelf. So not the way I mentioned them a minute ago. So apologies for that confusion. And finally, what about the way we involve all the different players in the supply chain and product design process? 
earlier in the earlier in the development process so we can actually deal with some of those problems really up front now, of course that might require you to change some of your current ways of thinking but as einstein once said you know the significant problems we face can't be solved at the same level of thinking that we were at when we created them so hopefully over the next few slides we're going to challenge some of your current thinking first aspect we're going to consider is what we've referred to as late configuration or as some people refer to it postponement and the idea of this principle in supply chain planning is that we delay or postpone our commitment of a product to its final form i.e for example what particular variant will make for as long as possible uh, hopefully this diagram gives you an idea of how it might work out in practice this is a, a poorly configured product or design because actually the horizontal axis by the way is showing us the timeline for assembly the vertical axis shows us the number of different variations we're actually dealing with at each point in time so in this variant actually the components and sub assemblies that are unique to a particular product or a variant are added relatively early in that manufacturing assembly process so that means we're committed to the order or variant really early on so we're potentially dealing with a lot more variety variation increased stock holding as we work through the customer satisfaction process and therefore probably more complicated bills of material to be managed and so on if we get to a model whereby we've designed intelligently so we're only adding the variety right at the end as the finished product is put together um, so we're putting those items that are unique to a particular variant or a particular customer order right at the end of the process the amount of variety are we considering for most of the supply chain and assembly manufacturing and assembly process is far far fewer which allows us to keep our options open much closer to the point where the customer is placing his order and therefore we're managing in a much more intelligent way that uncertainty that we talked about earlier so that means it, it allows us potentially to reduce inventory um, or reduce the time from order order placement to delivery or both um, to give deal with those customer demands for individualization and reduce lead time that we talked at the beginning here's just a few examples of how that might that works out in the mini world from my history so the, the one on the left is the the front end assembly from the second generation mini which was the one i was particularly involved in before i, I left the business um, although i imagine the current mini is pretty similar and here what was what the team recognized was the potential to get the major suppliers of the components and sub assembly sub sub assemblies for that front end module to work together right from the early design stage to allow it to be assembled pretty much at the last minute you know all very a very short time before the car was going down the production line so they only had to make decisions as to which color bumper what chrome finishes to put on what lights to fit in and so on to meet the customer order really at the last minute rather than having to build lots of variations and hold those in stock ready for delivery to the factory um, a similar approach was taken to the facie assembly we illustrated on the right hand side where that was put together just up the road and on the current car it's actually put together by the supplier within the factory to reduce that lead time even further because of the greater number of variants that's come across now the interesting evolution of that on the current mini is actually some parts you can get made just for you so this is kind of non-standard parts now but you can actually get your name or some other wording or some unique little bit of design uh, custom 2d or 3d printed um, so that you produce a mini that is really 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 unique to you 
And of course, another option that, that, that was used there was certainly the items are actually fitted at the mini dealer and not in the factory. Although they're orderable as, as, as sort of options from the mini dealer, it's not a, a sort of aftermarket fit. It's something you can order when you order the car. But things like the roof decal are fitted in the factory, and that's really late configuration. So next thing we're top, topic is standard components. Over to Paul. Thanks, Harvey. So I, I guess we're all familiar with, with the benefits of using standard components in manufacturing. This is a, a topic that, that Harvey covers quite, quite comprehensively and is designed for manufacturing assembly calls. But what I want to do now is very quickly talk to you today about how these benefits have the same, if not even a greater impact across the supply chain. So the benefits of using standard components, I, I guess, as I said, I hope are well understood. That their reliability is better understood and proven. It can help to reduce design time and cost to test, for example. It enables you to use the specialist knowledge of your suppliers. And as a result, it means that you can focus on what, what you, got, you guys are good at as designers. What this means in the end-to-end -end supply chain is typically as follows. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real enabler to higher quality, so, so it's easy to achieve across the supply chain. Generally, not always of course, generally they are less expensive to buy. Uh, and as there are more supply options, it's easy to achieve higher availability uh, with reduced lead time. So remember that lead time challenge. Uh, and also it's easy to achieve less inventory, uh, particularly where you're able to share those component parts across a number of different products or, or supply chains. So let's explore these benefits of the supply chain in a little more detail. So let's consider now an organization that provides maintenance and repair capability over, over multiple sites. Here you can really start to see now that rule of 10 coming into play. So it's often stated that the cost to find and repair a defect in a component is 10 times greater at each level of assembly or distribution. That means once the product is in the field, that cost could be a thousand times more than if the same defect was found and resolved at initial assembly. The use of standard components can really help to reduce both the, pro the probability and the impact of this risk. Some of you will be aware of the fact that Samsung provides many of the standard parts to Apple. The result is really clear to see. One of these is an Apple and the other is a Samsung. I'm not sure if I can now tell the difference, even though I'm the one who copied the images across. In fact, Apple are probably the only company in the world who were able to take a standard components from their competitors and then remove features such as the headphone jack and the home button and then add $600 to the price. Perhaps a little less well known is the story of Apple's supply chain. Most of the stories around the resurgent success of Apple, once Steve Jobs returned in 1996, are all attributed to its design and innovation, to the way that Apple understood emerging consumer trends and the perceived quality of the products. What is a little less well reported is the role that Tim Cook played. Both Steve and Tim recognized huge issues in Apple's supply chain in the 1990s and set about rationalizing it at all levels. They reduced product variants, the number of locations, the number of suppliers, and the number of standard components that were being used. It was a real concerted and, and successful effort to streamline their end-to-end -end supply chain and to solve the excess inventory issues they had inherited. It also prepared their supply chain for the development of new product designs, the iPhone and the iPad, and onto their truly glo global footprint that we see today. If you want to read a little more on this aspect of Apple's success, we've included a couple of links in the further reading material at the end uh, of, of this presentation. What you'll read there is a really, really clear manifesto around supply chain needs influencing product design, driven by Tim, the supply chain expert, but also by Steve, the marketeer and the designer. I want to talk now a little bit about involving others that we mentioned earlier. So as you can see, we like our quotes. So let's talk a little bit more about this concept, the why, the how and the when. At one level, we are simply talking about the benefits of diversity and including different views and perspectives. Intuitively, it feels like the right thing to do, even though it has its challenges. It encourages the input of different ideas and approaches, 
and in theory it will help to improve the quality of the designs and also the help to deliver a competitive advantage. In our VUCA world, with all these competing demands from more complex supply chains and increasing customer expectations, it makes perfect sense to ensure that the voices of the various stakeholders are included and that suppliers, with their additional breadth of knowledge, are also engaged. We thought at this stage it might be quite interesting to think about this from a, a very different angle and to delve into the world of cybernetics. Some of you may have come across Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety. Ross Ashby worked in the 1950s and was heavily involved in the early research into the concept of cybernetics. His law, which actually relates to control systems, states in its simplest form that a control system must have as many possible states as a system it wants to control. This law has now been used in many other fields uh, and is helped to use to better articulate the challenges faced by organizations of all types in dealing with complexity. Implied is a recognition that an imbalance in a team or an organization's ability to, a, to be able to respond to the variety of problems and complexity it faces with the right or requisite number of available responses results in failure or breakdown. Put even more simply, it provides a real logical reason as to why it's important to involve more perspectives when designing for complex environments why it makes sense to ensure your end-to-end -end supply chain is represented as a stakeholder or stakeholders in your process, and why involving suppliers, for example, provide you with, with, with more available and appropriate options to respond to your product design needs. Now, to just change gear a little bit, the key reason for this early involvement, the need for involving people early is well illustrated in a picture I use pretty often. I mean, I'm sure some of you on this webinar will have seen it on previous webinars or on one of the courses I run, or you might have come across it elsewhere. It's quite a famous picture. And it makes the point that, you know, while they, they typically the cost of the design and development work on a product can be a small percentage of the total lifetime costs, the potential of that work carried out in the early phase to influence the cost and quality of the final product, while you've still got loads of design freedom, is many, many times that cost. And involving that wide range of stakeholders Paul described in the early phases of a product cycle has the potential to eliminate or at least vastly reduce the number of late changes you get near a product launch that would most likely result if those players were only involved later on and had request design changes in order to source, make or assemble the products or to avoid the sort of inventory stock holding implications of having to build in that variety too early in the assembly and manufacturing process. You know, and that idea isn't isn't just a good idea. It's underpinned by a lot of research into um, the, uh, the factors associated with the success of companies like Toyota uh, and those factors that have been emulated by so many other organizations. You know, researchers have written books about it and tried to capture these principles in or the way Toyota works into a number of key principles that both apply to the way they think about the business and the way they think about product development. And uh, I've just picked up a couple of here that talk to this specific point that says really take time at the upfront stage to involve and get agreement with everybody and everybody, then you'll be able to move much more quickly to compete, complete the project. So in the supply chain world, this extends to getting much more involved with your suppliers early on in the project. You know, why might you want to do that? You know, what are some of the benefits you get? Certainly lower development costs and time, optimized manufacturability, improved part quality, working on delivery schedules. All these things can be improved by working with your suppliers in a much more interactive way, right from the design stage in the product project, as that mini front end example earlier illustrated. But of course, for many organizations, that's going to require a very different approach and a different relationship with suppliers than they've had before, often moving from quite an adversarial style to one that is much, much more collaborative. 
which requires a lot of different ways of working as I've shown on the, the right hand side of the slide. You know, how many of you would say that you've got that sort of relationship with your suppliers? You know, so if, if you're trying to develop that sort of relationship, I'm not going to run through this slide in detail, but here's something you could maybe use as a checklist of the sorts of questions that you could be exploring with suppliers early on in the process. And uh, you may not have time to read all those, but as, as Rob said in the chat earlier, you can get copies of these slides through our uh, learning management system uh, if you follow the link that Rob put in the chat box earlier. So there we are. Three key areas where good attention in the design stage can really have big benefits into making supply chains simpler and cheaper to operate, help you to all offer individuality and reduce lead times. Now, not all of them are straightforward to implement. And we just wanted to get your thoughts, having listened to that, as to what some of the biggest barriers would be to using some of these ideas in your organization and your product development process so you know if you'd be really keen for you to drop your ideas in the chat box because those answers really help us to think about developing new content that's relevant to the sort of challenges you're facing because we're you know one of the things i'm think thinking about with paul is how we can expand our offering beyond the conventional design for manufacturability um, into dealing with some of these supply chain related issues. So what are the topics that, that you'd really think you need some help with if your organization was gonna venture into that space? I'll give you a, a minute or so to drop, think about that and drop some stuff in the box. Uh, and then I'll come back to, to wrap up the session. Hmm, so a whole range of interesting stuff coming up there. Some of it about culture, some of it about relationships, some of it about, you know, we're only dealing with small quantities. Oh, issues about which suppliers can we work with? Making bespoke products. Yeah, culture change is a really big point. Yeah, you know, Tom, Tom has made the point there, customer specific parts usually required at the very beginning. Um, so that makes it that makes it really challenging. But, you know, I think I, yeah, I'm, I can't immediately bring a good example to mind, but I'm sure there are somewhere there are ways of working that even allow you to, to at least uh, use lots of standard or common items, even if you have that sort of customer specific core piece. Yeah, policy requiring three quotes, real challenge. Yeah, you know, I think that was one we had to move away from in the car industry. Um, you know, to think about developing longer term, more strategic relationships with, with suppliers that actually address the cost issue in a different way. So a whole host of stuff there, you know, and, uh, you know, I know we've only really had the opportunity to skim the surface of these topics today. So here's just a few clues as to, to where you can get some further information. Uh, there's quite a, good, a few good books on the topic uh, that I've used over the years and refer to in some of the public courses. Uh, so there's some references there. And if you wanted to follow up on Paul's comment about getting the learning from Apple around their integration and their supply issues, then there's the links that he referred to there. Equally, you know, we, got, we go into a lot of these topics in a lot more detail on the public course program. Um, here's a little bit of a picture that shows how some of the other courses fit into this intersecting landscape. Um, you know, the big boxes are, are sort of the bigger public programs that talk about approach a subject from a high level. The little dark shaded boxes are where we take a deep dive into specific topics or tools. Um, and in terms of upcoming courses that are specifically relevant to, to today's discussion, uh, the Design for Manufacturability course, uh, 
the design reviews program how do we get more involvement from other functions in that design review process uh, an overview of the new product introduction process and then rounding off with uh, paul's course on supply chain management that runs oh, later Harvey. yes Rob. Yeah, and, and just to be aware that, that any delegates that come on or sign up for the design for manufacturability course on the 9th of july get a 20 percent discount quoting the um, number that we have on the screen there Brilliant. Yeah, please do, because, uh, you know, that course really is the one that digs deeper into some of the stuff we specifically talked about today. So if you do want to follow that up. Uh, yeah, I thought the big red box there was probably enough of a hint for people, Rob, but it's good to mention it. So, yeah, absolutely. So back back to you anyway, Rob, to sort of mention about the next webinar and to lead us into the Q&A. Brilliant. OK, <coughs> excuse me. As you can see, the the next webinar that we're going to be delivering is on the 12th of July, uh, and it's about creating uh, business protocols and how to write effectively. Uh, again, you can see uh, on the bottom there, there is a, uh, a link to do that. I've also in the chat box um, put in a number of links that are relevant to access the, the webinars that this webinar recording plus webinars that we've done in the past and look at what we do in the future, as well as links to uh, the courses that uh, Harvey has mentioned, so you can copy and paste them into your browsers. Or alternatively, visit the iMeki website and the training section uh, to be able to access them through that. And, uh, over to you, Harvey, for the Q&A. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, what a, I'm hoping, Rob, you've been watching the questions that have popped up in the chat box and look for some common themes that might be worth exploring. Um, to, be, not, to, I, to be honest, I think you, you, you've addressed them as you've gone along. There isn't much else that's, that's come up in relation to, 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 to that that people are putting, the, obviously being engaged with, with listening to you guys. Yeah, OK. So, so Hughes asked a question about after sales and, and, and is it worth redesign? Um, uh, it's a really interesting question because one of the things that I guess is not often recognized and may be true in industries other than us, certainly in the car industry, as soon as we stopped making a mainstream production car, you know, a car's in, a car's in production maybe in one form, maybe only for, for three, four, five years. And yet those cars are probably going to, going to be on the roads and need servicing in considerable volumes for a lot of time after that. And that is a, a unique supply chain challenge all of its own because potentially you're you're going to have those parts manufactured by a, a different supplier because they are going to be needed in much lower volumes so that means you might need to think about about how, does that require any redesign effort but there's a bit of me actually also thinking about how much variety of stuff do we need to hold in stock to satisfy after sales requirement and it's an even yeah, another of it, uh, sorry, what was going to say? Another way of thinking about how do we minimize the variety to the smallest num smallest part of the product? How much can be a common part? You know, even if it's not a standard off the shelf part, how much of the stuff we need to replace regularly is common to as many of our, as much of our product range as possible? So we're minimizing that manufacturing and, and stock holding challenge. I don't know whether that that talks to your point, Hugh, but it was just something that occurred to me as relevant in supply chain. Um, anybody got any more questions Harvey, Harvey. in the chat box? Sorry, Rob, yeah. Harvey, I was just going to say, whilst whilst uh, we, 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 we get the questions in from, from, from the platform, just to build on that, I guess the reason why we raise this point is that the, the, the rationale for thinking more about after sales, for example, in design, is also linked to those changes in business strategy and business models. So I guess the starting question for a lot of this, which we didn't really talk about very explicitly, is it does start with a business's strategy and where it's looking to get um, its revenue in the future. And what we are seeing in many, many industries is that trend away from the, the revenue is not coming necessarily from the product sale, but from the ongoing services, and that's the servitization model. Um, but to do that, you have to then start thinking about designing for that after sales environment. Yeah. I think, Harvey, there's, there's uh, th three, two or three questions in the, in the chat box that have uh, come 
uh, from a number of our delegates. Okay, do you want to do you want to pick them up? And remind me, Rob. Sorry, I saved me scrolling back. Have you got them to hand? Uh, they should be right at the bottom of the chat box. The latest ones that come in. Oh, the latest ones. Okay, so yeah. some of those were just comments. Oh yeah. So so the question about about what if what if something takes twenty one months to be manufactured, and and I guess we're into into a different sort of standardisation challenge there. But but you know the, the, probably the nearest example I'm thinking of is is let's take Rolls Royce and the aeroplane engine industry. I mean, if we go back to the to the sort of 60s and 70s, aeroplane manufacturers pretty much took what was the, the current about the right sized engine from, from Pratt & Whitney or from Rolls-Royce or from Turbomeca or whoever it was. But increasingly, you know, as, as aeroplane design has changed and evolved, um, there's ended up being a requirement for a unique aeroplane engine for um every variant of aeroplane that's made and they're pretty long lead time items probably not 21 months so it's probably not quite close to your to your question but again that the approach rolls royce took is quite interesting is they said can we design a set of common components that we can configure in slightly different ways to allow us to customize the engine for a particular aeroplane without having to redesign every single part. Um, you know, so they, they were building common components, common sub-assemblies, or at least designing the parts so they could make a slightly different sized variant, say to get a bigger fan, using the same basic design and just being able to scale it up easily. So they were really thinking about what is it that we can keep common as much as possible even given we're on a much longer lead time production process so we're using those common parts or the common design process because i, I guess maybe in the the sort of oil and gas industry a lot of parts are being designed even as manufacturers started you know if you're on that long lead time sort of scale so you know i certainly don't you know i don't know exactly but that's the sort of thing that would come to mind um, and then trying to create a standardised catalogue of piece parts and sub assemblies. Tom, I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand what your question is. Are you thinking about piece parts and sub assemblies that you make? Because I think, yeah, I mean, I think if that's the interpretation, it's about maybe taking a strategic approach to thinking about your future product range rather than thinking about it one product at a time. You know, one of the ways the car industry's dealt with the fact that people want more and more body styles is to think about design for thinking about a whole family of products rather than one particular range. So if you want a, a an SUV and a people carrier and a sports coupe and a, 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 a hatchback and a saloon car and a slightly more upmarket version, or if you're Jaguar or Land Rover, you want a Jaguar version, and a Land Rover version, you want a Skoda, you want a Volkswagen, you want to, is think about the whole family at the beginning and say, to what extent can we commonize parts and assemblies? And the only way that's achieved is by thinking the whole family at the beginning. You know, the, res the, the, the research into this in the car industry goes back to the sort of, back to the 90s is a really good book Paul recommended to me, actually. I'm just looking across at my bookshelf uh, to see if I remember the title. It's a book called Thinking Beyond Lean by Cusimano and Nobeoka. That was a research project that was done thinking about the challenges of taking a, a family of products and then thinking about, hey, what are the decisions you need to make right at the beginning that will allow you to retain that degree of commonization of piece parts and sub-assemblies as you build the family over a period of years. So I don't know whether that that helps with your question, Tom. But again, it's the sort of stuff that that we've dealt with that came to mind that might be helpful. OK, so I guess that's that's bringing us neatly to the end of time, isn't it, Rob? Do you want to wrap up for us? No problem. <laughs> Just want to say thank you very much uh, for joining us today uh, thank you very much for your participation and your comments it's been very helpful and very useful thank you to harvey and paul 
who excellently kept us entertained for the last hour and, and, and whatever information that they've put across to us. As I said, the, uh, I'm also sign up for the next webinar and you can get recording of this shortly uh, via the links that I've set in the chat box. Thank you very much.